Hello and welcome to This Is Our Shot and what I think you will find to be a great program. We have more than 300 people here today and I am so pleased to welcome each and every one of you. My name is Martha Rabour and I am the Executive Director of Shot at Life, which is a campaign that sits within the UN Foundation. We work to protect children around the world from vaccine preventable diseases. And we do this through grassroots advocacy. We rally Americans to reach out to their policymakers and encourage them to support the important work of UNICEF, the World Health Organization, and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. So we are here today to share with you about global immunization programs, those to combat COVID-19, and other diseases in an attempt to save children's lives from deadly infectious diseases. It is our honor to co-host this event with UNICEF and they will tell you more about the life-saving work they are doing around the world. But I want for now, I want you to retain two figures. The first one is 85% and the second one is seven billion dollars. So listen for those figures and I'll come back to them later in the program. I hope that once you learn more, you'll be inspired to joining us by signing a petition asking your members of Congress to robustly fund programs so children and people around the world can have access to life-saving vaccines. For a quick review of the context, context in which we find ourselves today, we're going to play a short video of news clips. Over to video, please. Quarantine, state of emergency, shelter in place. The story of the coronavirus changes by the hour. So how exactly did we get here? But across the world, dozens were falling ill with a mysterious virus that would ultimately change life as we know it. Chinese health authorities are still working to identify the virus behind a pneumonia outbreak in the central city of Wuhan. At least 59 people are believed to have been sickened by the new virus. The WHO worries hard-won gains could be lost if delays in vaccinations go from weeks to months. Not immunizing a group of infants is going to lead to a large number of kids who are non-immune. Um, and we have a really big issue then of outbreaks of disease happening, non-COVID outbreaks. Two UN agencies have warned that the spread of the coronavirus has led to a dramatic fall in the numbers of children, being, children receiving life-saving vaccines around the world. The result means that many could die from illnesses that could have easily been treated for more. The WHO and also UNICEF are calling for an increased effort to keep these vaccinations up to date because they say that we will get over the COVID-19 virus, but if we don't inoculate these children, then they're going to be at much greater risk. The FDA authorized a COVID-19 vaccine for emergency use, marking the fastest vaccine development in history. Most vaccines take about 10 years to create, but the coronavirus vaccine has made record time. Scientists of both Pfizer and Moderna chose to create a messenger RNA vaccine, otherwise known as mRNA that triggers the immune system to create antibodies without having to use actual parts of the virus. This allowed for the vaccines to be created more quickly and easily. But the pandemic isn't over yet. Distribution will be a challenge and millions of people will have to wait months before getting their shots. Canada has already pre-ordered enough vaccine to inoculate every citizen nearly six times. And the U.S. has enough purchase options to vaccinate everyone nearly five times, leaving much of the world scrambling. As wealthier countries shell out hundreds of millions of dollars to secure coveted first access to vaccines, meanwhile the most vulnerable are at risk of being shut out. Australia, Canada and Japan have less than 1% of the coronavirus cases, but they have more doses than all of Latin America and the Caribbean, which have close to 20%. That's where COVAX comes in, a coalition of global health players, including the World Health Organization and UNICEF. The starting goal, buy $2 billion of vaccine to inoculate 20% of the population in the world's 100 or so poorest countries, considered the greatest logistical undertaking in history. It's called COVAX and works like a global vaccine buying club. 
that allows rich countries to subsidise vaccines for poorer countries and pool demand to get better prices. The COVAX initiative right now has how much money in hand? Around $2 billion in hand. And how much do you need to make it all happen? Around $17 billion for everything. There are a lot of people who say this is just way too expensive. This is way too expensive for America not to get involved with. How can we not afford the billions of dollars that will save the trillions of dollars? Following his inauguration, President Biden was quick to announce America would join the group of 190 participating economies. Equitably sharing vaccines is the fastest way to safeguard high-risk communities, stabilize health systems, and drive a truly global economic recovery. So as this news shows, this, and we all know, this is the challenge of our lives. We are at an important crossroads of historic importance due to this pandemic. And we need to work collectively to protect the most vulnerable from this virus and stop its spread. We know that this will set the precedent for global health moving forward. This is our shot to get equity right. We have learned from this pandemic that a disease anywhere is potentially a threat everywhere. And until we are all safe, no one is truly safe. So we must all work together to help defeat COVID-19 around the world. Now, in some ways, this is simple. We know that vaccines work. They've been saving millions of lives a year over the past 30 years and even well before that. The question is, can we commit the resources to deploy them equitably, deploy them around the world? So to discuss all of this, we have a great program of impressive speakers for you today. To kick us off, I'd like to introduce Jeremy Lin, professional basketball player and someone who chooses to use his voice and his influence for good. You may know Jeremy from the Lynn Sanity phenomenon back in 2011 and 2012 when he played for the New York Knicks. Jeremy is also the first Asian American to win an NBA championship and one of the first to ever play in the NBA. Jeremy will be talking to someone I greatly admire, the good friend of Shot at Life, Robin Nandy, the chief of global immunization at UNICEF. Now, imagine how busy he is right now, yet he's taken time out of his busy schedule to share with all of us. So now, over to you, Jeremy and Robin. Thanks, Martha. Hi, Robin. Uh, very nice to meet you. Um, I understand that you are UNICEF's chief of immunizations. So what does that mean, basically? Hi, Jeremy. It's nice meeting you. Uh, I do a lot of interviews. This is the first time I'm actually being interviewed by a celebrity. So really excited about this. Um, so what do I do? Uh, Chief of Immunizations. Yeah, well, um, uh, UNICEF uh, has a long history in uh, involving itself with uh, immunization programs globally, um, uh, supporting governments uh, to run immunization, childhood immunization programs. Um, we we basically work in countries with the World Health Organization, uh, establishing vaccination policies, helping governments do their planning, micro planning, uh, uh, helping them uh, design and, 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 and strengthen their supply chains. Very importantly, Jeremy, uh, uh, UNICEF is also the largest uh, procurer and supplier of vaccines. We annually procure and supply uh, 2 billion doses of vaccines globally uh, in over 100 countries. So, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a global reach. I work at headquarters, uh, you know, with a small team supporting our teams and our country offices uh, in their support of governments delivering immunization programs. I'm really curious, Jeremy, how you got involved with UNICEF and how you use your platform. Uh, and, and, you know, you're a real role model uh, that we all look up to uh, as a sporting celebrity uh, and, 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 and and doing so much charity work. And I'm sure the, the audience would like to hear from you as well. 
Um, I mean, for me, you know, I've, I've uh, donated and worked with UNICEF before. And um, I mean, everything about uh, UNICEF is what humanity uh, is about in terms of helping underprivileged children, giving children a chance to, uh, whether it's, it's life or education or health access or, um, you know, all these different things that, that UNICEF does. And so for me, this is a huge part of what, uh, what I want to help to do, um, especially with my, my, uh, you know, my platform and, and the followers and people that, you know, I have the ability to influence. I definitely want to drive more and more awareness towards this. And so, um, when this specifically came up, especially with immunizations and when you're talking about COVID and different things like that, I mean, again, we start to see, um, things just aren't always equal and things just aren't always fair. And if we don't have, you know, me as one person, I can do not much. Um, but UNICEF has given, like you said, what was it? 2 billion. Um, like I can't even to, to give that many, uh, you know, immunizations and to help so many children. That's just something that's like, and I just hope to be a small, small part of that. Um, and so what you guys are doing is amazing. And um, I bet you're a busy man. <laughs> um, but no, that's why I wanted to get get involved and uh, just use uh, my, my small little voice to be able to say um, and drive awareness towards, hey, this is really important. And we need kids. Uh, and we hope kids can get this opportunity because we know that not every kid is going to have an equal opportunity. Um, so thank you for doing what you do. Um, and thank you, Jeremy, for, for supporting us. It's really, really important. No, not a problem at all. And, uh, you know, I had a question is we, we've been hearing a lot about the COVID vaccines, um, but you work on what you call the routine childhood immunizations. So what does that mean exactly um, when you use that term? So basically, that's the uh, regular childhood vaccination program, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, immunization programs in in every country on the pl in, on on the planet, and uh, you know, uh, 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 a childhood immunization program that started with uh, you know five or six vaccines now is delivering uh, you know in many countries uh, uh, more than fifteen vaccines to children. This includes vaccines for diseases like polio, measles, uh, tetanus, uh, uh, whooping cough, uh, uh, you know, uh, pneumonia, the, uh, uh, you know, diarrhea vaccines. Uh, and, and so, you know, when we say we support routine immunization program, we basically support the machine that delivers these, uh, you know, to all kids. The routine vaccination program has actually been uh, you know, really uh, successful program reaching 85% uh, of kids globally, uh, you know, with vaccines. Wow. Uh, and, and it's huge because it's, 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 it's got a bigger reach than most other uh, child health or any other health program in terms of coverage. So it is a, it is a major platform to build off for more comprehensive essential health services uh, for children. So the reach of immunization programs um, is 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 huge, but we are not satisfied at 85 percent. We really want to, uh, you know, we 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 still see uh, children dying of vaccine preventable diseases, and for us that's unacceptable. One of the things that I'm definitely, you know, interested in hearing about um, is how has UNICEF been helping with. The global response to COVID nineteen because I know we you know you had mentioned measles and and things like that and and diseases like that and so um, I think right now one of the you know things that everybody's talking about is COVID nineteen and so what does that look like specifically with UNICEF? Well, UNICEF have been uh, involved in the COVID nineteen response from the get go uh, and and uh, this uh, you know took you know, different shapes and forms. As you know, Jeremy, we work uh, not only in the health sector, we work in education, we work in child protection, nutrition, water, sanitation, uh, in addition to health. So, you know, we we, 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 we initiated a multi-sectoral response. Uh, the initial part of our response uh, 
in 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 early 2020 was the direct response to COVID-19. Uh, so helping the health system cope with, uh, you know, uh, transmission, large uh, number of cases. This included providing supplies uh, for the treatment of COVID-19, uh, including oxygen concentrators, um, you know, other drugs and medications. We 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 um, we uh, uh, were the lead agency also uh, on on risk communication, uh, making people aware. Uh, you know, uh, 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 promoting preventive practices, wearing masks, hand washing, and so on. Um, so, uh, but but at the same time, uh, because of COVID, uh, we saw huge disruption to child health services, including immunization, but not restricted to immunization. So, you know, people were unable to go to health centers because they were either scared to go uh, to to health centers because of fear of COVID uh, transmission or transport disruptions or lockdowns uh, meant that they couldn't get to health uh, uh, services. In some cases, health services, uh, you know, could not be delivered because uh, the, the, the workforces and resources were all diverted to the COVID response. So the, the second part uh, of UNICEF's work was to make sure that essential services continue, including things like nutritional services, schools, you know, keeping uh, you know, uh, children learning has been a huge part of UNICEF's work uh, 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 during the past year. So I think, uh, and and in in my area of work, uh, immunization services were hugely disrupted. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, coverage dropped by uh, you know 50 percentage points, um, and uh, uh, so you know, as we were responding to the COVID-19 outbreak. We were also trying to see, to make sure that the disruption in health services um, is, you know, is addressed. And now, on top of the disruptions and everything that we are dealing with COVID, and now we are challenged with the uh, delivery of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, which is both very exciting, but also daunting, because you know we are trying to uh, deliver a vaccine at a scale that we've never done before. This is the first time in history, Jeremy, that countries of all income levels, high, middle, low income countries, all continents are, 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 are attempting to uh, introduce uh, or roll out this, uh, you know, a, a vaccine at the same time. And, you know, obviously that's, uh, you know, that's a major challenge. I mean, I think for me, the one thing that I'm so blown away at is just the comprehensive attack on you know, really, you know, and, and I read your guys' uh, vision statement and mission statement and things like that and talking about just all the different resources and uh, ways that you try to help uh, a, a, a child. And so, you know, hearing from you guys, hearing from you, especially with, with COVID, it's, you know, there's the immediate relief and, and help of health, whether it's ventilators or things like that. And there's also the prevention of it, which is the vaccine, but then there's also all the other things that go on afterwards in terms of getting proper food and schooling and, and those type of things that continue to, because you can't just stop somewhere and, and just say, okay, well, they may have, you know, recovered from COVID and that's it. And so um, that's really, really inspirational. And I love um, everything. And I know that I learned a ton and uh, you're a hero for a lot of uh, children who don't even know it, Robin. So thank you so much. For everything you're doing for the time to share your knowledge and also for just everything that you're doing day in day out to be able to get as many immunizations as you can to as many children to save lives that's awesome people in the audience want to hear from you uh, uh jeremy and how did COVID affect you jeremy i mean you know i mean you've got a you know your huge schedule of training games and so on uh, you know how do you cope i mean how has the year evolved for you jeremy um, COVID has definitely affected me in different ways um, in terms of, you know, stuff that isn't as important as the way that it's actually affecting a lot of people who are battling uh, right now. And, and so for me, things are a little bit different for sure. And the timing of the seasons and everything and, and you know, games and leagues and all these different things getting postponed. But, you know, honestly, this is not, uh, these aren't serious problems. We're talking about being able to play basketball. Um, but we see so many people who are, if they're not dealing or having 
dealt with COVID or having lost life because of COVID, then they're dealing with the tremendous you know, negative effects of what happened with COVID to the economy, to their business, to their dreams, to everything that they had been working towards. And all of a sudden the whole industry and the whole economy shifts and you don't, you know, some people, so many people are left. And I think that's what's, you know, and that's what I'm trying to realize is like, I'm playing basketball and that's a, that's an honor, but how can I do something more with basketball knowing that basketball is a sport and it's a game that people love to watch, but there's so many other people going through really tough things. And so, you know, that's really a big part of why I'm actually really glad that you spent most of the time talking because, you know, it's really important to learn. And, and, you know, uh, I think it's important for all of us to get educated and to figure out how can we help? Um, how can we help? Because, you know, like you said, UNICEF is about equity. UNICEF is about saving kids lives, giving them a chance. I mean, that is something that's extremely purposeful and meaningful. And so, um, you know, it hasn't affected me nearly as much as it has others. And, and that's why I want to learn more and try to do more to help. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And uh, great talking to you. Um, and all the best, all the best to you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Now it's up to you. You can add your voice to the call for everyone to have access to life-saving vaccines, no matter where they live. If you live in the U.S., please join me in signing the petition at shotatlife.org backslash petition to ask your members of Congress to robustly fund global immunization programs. You got to go do it and do it now. Yes, please do it. And uh, for Jer Jeremy's benefit, uh, I'm going to use the uh, warrior's slogan, strength in numbers. Uh, this is the time for global solidarity. Please do go ahead and sign the pet petition. And thank you for your support. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of introducing my executive director, my boss, Henrietta Four, uh, for her keynote address. Over to you, ED4. Thank you very much, Robin, and thank you very much, Jeremy. It is great to join you this afternoon, and I love the end of this. Um, how can we help, Jeremy said. So it's especially great to see all the young people, but be a hero and be a heroine. We need your voices and your engagement. We need you lending your hands and your hearts to the great task of recovering, of recovering better and stronger than before through this pandemic. So everyone at UNICEF also appreciates our tireless partners at Shot at Life for your support for immunization and child health here in the United States, but also around the world. From helping fund our measles and polio work to keeping children's needs front and center on Capitol Hill, to supporting the work of government partners like USAID to carry out vaccination programs around the world and the CDC to fight preventable diseases here at home. To events like this one, we aim to shine, shine a light, a light on what is most basic and on what is most important to all of us impactful and inexpensive things, things we can do to keep children alive and healthy and thriving, and it's immunizations. So since the late 18th century, vaccines have reduced the scourge of diseases that used to stalk millions, smallpox and polio and measles, for example. Thanks to vaccines, 37 million vaccine, pardon me, 37 million deaths have been prevented in the last 20 years in low and middle income countries just because of these vaccines. And now they represent a critical path forward to ending COVID-19 pandemic. Given the importance of vaccines to children's lives, immunizations have been a cornerstone of UNICEF's work from the very beginning. Every year we join our partners to vaccinate 85% of the world's children. And Robin Nandy just mentioned this number. It's an extraordinary number, but it's not good enough. So we want to do 100% of the world and you can help. 
For example, together, we have reduced polio cases by 99.9% .9 in the last 30 years and are committed to taking the last difficult steps to end this disease. But COVID-19 is taking a serious toll on our efforts around the world. Human and financial resources are being diverted to address the pandemic. Health services are being disrupted and lockdowns and physical distancing are preventing people from accessing care. We're seeing disruptions in the manufacture, the transportation and the delivery of vaccines and even the suspension of vaccination campaigns including measles and polio vaccination for millions of children globally. In some places, routine immunization coverage has dropped by 50%, leaving many children vulnerable to life-threatening diseases. At the same time, another kind of disease has flourished along with the pandemic. It's vaccine misinformation. We've all seen that suspicious social media post claiming that vaccines do not work or even are dangerous to use. We're worried that this erosion of trust in vaccines and in health services more generally could create hesitancy, not only for getting the COVID-19 vaccine, but for routine immunizations. This is a huge risk because diseases and viruses can only be defeated if everyone everywhere accepts the vaccine, what they call accepting the jab. Over the decades, UNICEF has built up considerable expertise and experience in delivering and administering vaccines in countries around the globe and in building community trust in them. We're the single largest vaccine buyer in the world. We procure more than 2 billion doses of vaccines annually for both routine immunizations and outbreak response on behalf of about 100 countries. We also work directly in and with communities worldwide to tackle misinformation, to build trust, create demand for and acceptance of vaccines. This includes providing accurate information to more than 100 million social media subscribers. We're also using radio channels for remote areas, for example, in India. We're working with South Africa's government on their vaccine communication plan to tackle misinformation, but also to build trust. In Bangladesh, youth volunteers are working with us to monitor, to report, and to respond to misinformation that they see on social media in real time. And now we're bringing all of this work together as we prepare for the greatest vaccine, vaccine drive in history. Defeating COVID-19 requires delivering up the vaccines equitably, but also to every person in the world, prioritizing health workers and at-risk populations because the light at the end of the tunnel needs to shine for everyone, whether they live in wealthy communities, in a crowded urban slum, or in a remote village, or in a refugee camp, or in a country enduring conflict or natural disaster. The pandemic will not end for any of us until it ends for all of us. And that's where the COVAX facility comes in. It's a collaborative effort between WHO, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and SEPI, and ourselves. Together, we're ensuring that low and middle income countries have access to the vaccines too, and that vaccines are affordable and available to all. UNICEF is proud to be the lead procurement agency for COVAX. We've already procured up to 1.1 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines for around 100 countries. The rollout will begin in the next coming weeks and we're urging all countries to start vaccinating within the first 100 days of this year. In total, we're aiming to procure 2 billion doses this year, a potential doubling of UNICEF's annual vaccine procurement. We want to reach all health and frontline workers, as well as the high risk groups. And we want to ensure that each participating country has enough vaccines for at least 20% 
of their population by the end of 2021. But this is not just about making vaccines available. It also means ensuring the safe delivery so that UNICEF is also working closely with countries in how they prepare. We're mapping out cold chains to keep vaccines viable. We're working with vaccine manufacturers to supply agreements. We're working with transportation and the freight industry to ensure delivery to the most challenging of locations. And we're working to ensure that there are enough syringes and safety boxes to put the used syringes in to get the job done. As we work to defeat COVID-19, we're also keeping our focus on other routine vaccination and outbreak response efforts, just as Robin and Jeremy were talking about. We cannot allow the fight against one disease to come at the expense of another. As we deliver COVID-19 vaccines, we also need to maintain the continuity of routine childhood immunizations. After all, routine immunizations and COVID-19 vaccines will be delivered to different population subgroups and need to be separately resourced. We cannot run the risk that a COVID-19 delivery comes at the expense of a routine immunization delivery. Throughout all of this work, we are counting on the support of our global partners and donors. And this includes our American partners. We need your help and we need the help of everyone at Shot at Life to help us turn up the volume on these massive needs. So first, amplify our call to the public and to the private sector partners and to also include the philanthropists. Help us to help COVAX reach its funding. It has a $7 billion fundraising goal and stress the need to help fund the poorest countries rollouts. Their health systems can be very fragile and this is UNICEF's work and we see it firsthand. Second, across your networks, urge vaccine manufacturers and countries with surplus vaccines to donate as many doses as they can. This is a critical part of COVAX especially as we accelerate access to the vaccines for health and frontline workers across low and middle income countries. And third, help us keep the focus on other essential health services and routine immunizations that have been hit so hard by the pandemic. We cannot solve one problem, COVID-19, while neglecting the many other challenges that we face especially when 20 million children around the world do not get the full benefits of basic vaccinations that they need against preventable diseases. UNICEF, WHO, and Gavi do all of this work together. So use your networks with the members of Congress. Tell them that global vaccination programs are important to you and use the same network to support science and correct misinformation. So thank you to our partners at Shot at Life for standing with UNICEF and the global immunization partners at this critical moment. We need your help and we need your voice. Together, we will find a way out of this pandemic and continue our work to shape a better, healthier, and more peaceful future for children everywhere. So may I just say thank you and over to you, Martha. Thank you, Executive Director Ford, for your remarks. And I can tell you, we are all ready to turn up the volume. You are correct. Uh, the fact that 20 million children are still not getting the vaccines that they need should be motivation enough. I think we're all very motivated from your remarks, so thank you. We've, we've learned that we all have a role to play in ensuring that children around the world are safe and can thrive. And I wanna ask the audience, I hope you picked up the 85% and the 7 billion that I referred to earlier. UNICEF with its partners vaccinates 85% of the world's children. And I think that's an impressive number that we should all remember. And I also want you to remember 7 billion because that $7 billion is the amount of money we need to raise this year to support COVAX 
which is the effort to roll out the COVID-19 vaccine around the world in order to protect, as Executive Director Force said, the health the healthcare workers, the frontline workers, just that 20% most vulnerable in countries around the world. And lastly, I just want to emphasize something that we all know to be so true at Shot at Life, and that is that vaccines are safe, they are proven, and they are effective. We all know we can go on the internet now and you can find a counter argument to almost anything you want to come up with. Um, but again, I will repeat, vaccines are safe, proven, and effective. And we have many scientists willing to talk to you if you have questions about it. But the, the science is on, on the side of vaccines and they are going to be our way out of this pandemic. Um, so now it is my pleasure to introduce a great friend and an ambassador for the Shot at Life campaign. And that is global parenting expert, Joe Frost. Joe has worked with thousands of families across the US and around the world, and she is passionate about keeping children healthy. Now, over to you, Joe. Thank you for joining us today. Whether you're a frontline health worker, have been avidly following the news around COVID-19 vaccines, or this was your first time learning about global immunization programs. All parents want the chance to protect their children. As a global parenting expert, I'm grateful that I get the opportunity to meet and listen to thousands of families around the world. No matter their location or life circumstance, the one thing all parents have in common is that they will do whatever it takes to keep their children healthy and out of harm's way. Parents protecting their children is innately hardwired in them. We've all learned in this pandemic how important it is to be healthy so we can be together. Vaccines can bring us closer, closer together and closer to eradicating vaccine preventable diseases so every child and individual can lead a healthy and productive life. Through today's event, I hope you have deepened your understanding of the life-saving impact that vaccines and good health have in families, communities and the world. Today, what you have heard, I hope has inspired you to recognise that your voice and support counts. We together get this very unique opportunity in these extraordinary times to truly impact the safety of the world we live in. And it's going to take all of us to shift this energy so that global immunization programs remain a priority. I'm asking you today, like me today, to take action because we need your help. Your advocacy will help fund important global health and immunization programs and help prevent the next pandemic and backsliding on a global health progress. So please take a few minutes to make your voice heard. Sign the petition at shotatlife.org forward slash petition to let your policymaker know that you support the just distribution of vaccines. I promise you, your advocacy makes a huge difference for millions of children around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, um, for reminding us that vaccines can bring us closer together and the importance of all of our voices and advocacy and reaching out to policymakers. By tuning in today and learning about vaccines and some of the challenges facing immunization efforts, you have all taken the first step in becoming advocates and helping bring about positive change. I hope you were inspired to learn about the important work of UNICEF that helps ensure all the world's children and people have access to life-saving vaccines. I also hope that you will take time to sign the petition so that we can defeat COVID and other infectious diseases around the world. This is our shot.
I want to give a big thanks to my team at Shot at Life, to our colleagues at UNICEF, our special guests, Jeremy Lin and Robin Nandy and Joe Frost. And finally, a big thanks to all of you for giving up part of your Sunday to be with us. For more information or any questions, please visit shotatlife.org and please sign our petition. Thank you.